My name is Chris. As, uh, as Anna said, I work for Stroud District Council and um, I run and manage our um, natural flood management project over the other side of the River Severn. And um, the project's been running for about eight years. Uh, I've managed it for five of them. In between, I went off for a, a bit of a rest to the Environment Agency and uh, decided to come back to, to crack on with some um, more operational work, let's say. So um, I'll tell you a bit about the, the project. What I'm going to cover is um, how natural flood management works, um, try and make that understandable, um, what we do, what we actually physically do on the ground and the changes that we try to make, and then look at where we attempt to do it and where we might not, according to the, um, the sort of different approaches we might want to take. Uh, but then also, importantly, look at how we can go about it. So, so you know, clearly we can't just um, turn up at someone's field and start doing natural flood management. There's a, there's a whole process that I think I want to cover about who's involved, who can take part, how the communities take part, how the landowners and farmers take part, um, and, and how that works, and what we've, the lessons we've, we've kind of um, learnt as we've gone on in Stroud. <coughs> So just a very small introduction, um, our project is funded by the English Seven and Y Regional Flood and Coastal Committee um, through one of their budget lines, which is called the local levy. So that's everyone's, a small amount of everyone's council tax uh, within the area gathered together to pay my salary. And um, it pays that and it also covers a lot of the capital costs. Um, and the overheads involved in employing me. So this is um, a, a levy which every regional flood and coastal committee has, um, and but only a small number of them have decided to make use of it in this fashion by funding this type of work. And we got going in 2014, and um, clearly there's lots of partners involved, which I'll come on to, and... Um, What's interesting though, I know one early lesson in funding this type of work, is that of the funding we've received, I'd say only about 30% of it has actually been spent on building things or making changes. A lot of it is spent on time, uh, resources, talking to people, communicating, and, um, and building the sort of relationships and trust uh, that I think are absolutely essential for this type of work. That's the catchment that um, I work in. It's one of the many river frooms, or frooms, depending upon which part of the country you live. Um, and it's about 250 square kilometers of land that flow west into the, um, the River Severn. And that red line uh, runs through my office in Ebley Mill, where our council is based. So everything to the right of that um, is showing the upstream area of the catchment. It's about 200 square kilometers. So that's effectively our operating area. And um, for those of you who know People's Republic of Stroud, it's also called the Five Valleys uh, because we've got lots of tributaries flowing in there. So it's, it's largely it's sat on the edge of that Cotswold limestone plateau. Um, very uh, biodiverse, very mixed woodland rich um, farming area um, our arable tends to be on the top where we've got all the free draining permeable soils and then our permanent grasslands tend to be in the valley bottoms where you get more clay uh, harder to work so so we we in many ways I, I often describe it as we're sort of an upside down uh, farming environment in some ways compared to uh, lots of the country where the uplands tend to be the grasslands. Um, so we've got very interesting geology, interesting streams, uh, and an interesting landscape to work in. So how does natural flood management work? This is a, uh, it's not a very expert graph, but I thought it might give an impression as to what we're trying to do. Very simply, when it rains, 
the flows go up and they peak and then they pop back down again. Uh, what we're trying to do is squeeze the same amount of water or slightly less water, as we'll come on to, um, through the system but over a slightly longer time period. So the difference between, I don't know if that pointer works, no. uh, the difference between those two is our flood risk reduction. Um, that's what we're trying to do, but this is easier to understand. And um, I forgot to bring my funnel because you can get a nice good demonstration actually. So if you imagine the funnel in your kitchen is a catchment and you've got this incredibly wide area <clears throat> that flows down through extremely narrow things that we've built into the landscape. Bridges, culverts, houses, flood defences even. So you've got this vast area of land and all the water in it is flowing to these tiny pinch points. So it represents a catchment really well, but it also represents <clears throat> what we're trying to achieve in natural flood management. So, so if you're pouring some liquid into a bottle and you chose a poor sized funnel, what happens when you pour your liquid into the bottle? It comes over the back of the funnel because it can't all fit through the gap. And in many respects, quite a lot of flooding we experience in our country is the kitchen funnel flood. It's trying to get too much water through a tiny hole in the landscape too quickly. So you've got two options. You can either use a bigger funnel, and that's a good strategy, um, and it works, providing the top of your funnel hasn't got a cinema on top of it, or a bus station, as we have in Stroud, or houses. Sometimes you can't increase the size of the funnel. So what's the other strategy you've got? Go on, someone tell me. You slow it down. You pour it more slowly through the funnel. And that, in essence, is exactly what we're trying to achieve with natural flood management. So sometimes we can't fix the funnel. We've got to just pour our stuff more slowly through it. Now, I'm not suggesting that all flooding in Britain is of this type. Clearly, lots of other floods occur on the fens, on the levels, other places where it's a volume of water gathering or on wide floodplains. But the type of flooding that we can deal with through natural flood management is this type of flood. It's, the, it's trying to get too much water through the system. And there's quite a lot of um, reasonable evidence, let's say, um, around this stuff. Um, 2017, the uh, Oxford Martin School, which often is, is known as one of these kind of uh, schools at Oxford University that will reappraise and summarise huge amounts of evidence and bring it together and synthesise it into reports. And they produced their re last report, I think, on this in 2017. And, um, and they said, they looked at lots of different strategies, that what we might call slowing the flow, this type of intervention, works very well, and there's good evidence, for what we might call low magnitude, high frequency events. So those are, are floods that might be occurring, you know, on a one in 10 year basis or one in 20 year basis. So not so much water, but, but very frequent flooding. They're also good at what we might call muddy or surface flooding, um, surface flows uh, either from land uh, or in urban areas. We call that sustainable drainage. It's a slightly different topic that we, we, we won't cover today. Um, but it also works better in these smaller catchments. And the reason it works better in smaller catchments is quite simply because the probability of intervening in the amount of water we need to influence is much greater when there's less of it there. So, so if you've got a small one kilometer squared patch of land your ability to influence all the water on that one kilometre squared is quite high, whereas if you've got a thousand square kilometres, it's very tricky because you don't know where it's all coming from. There's tens of thousands of sources and, and flows, and dealing with them all is very hard. So it, it, at the minute, we can sort of summarise by saying the evidence suggests that this type of approach works very well for the, uh, the more frequent flooding 
which is of smaller scale. Now that makes it sound like it's kind of nice friendly flooding and it's not so bad, but there are hundreds of thousands of properties across the country that would suffer from this type of flooding. Um, so our ability to help those people is quite high. Um, there's a really good, what they also found was there's really nice synergy, which we're going to hear a lot more about in my talk and later, around um, between this work and water quality improvements, groundwater recharge and nature recovery. Uh, what we might call floodplain restoration, so natural flood management is a, is a big continuum in some ways. So working downstream on these big floodplains is a very effective strategy for higher magnitude floods. So, you know, more serious floods that, that cover more area and it can be effective for larger catchments and larger populations. So in effect, we've got to think about the flooding that might be occurring in the Forest of Dean very differently to the flooding that might be occurring on the main River Wye. We've got a few basic principles that I think it's worth uh, thinking about. Natural flood management is a catchment wide approach. It is not going into a place and doing one or two massive things because that won't be effective. It's the cumulative benefit of multiple features over a wide area. Um, you can't restore curly populations or lapping populations on one farm or in one field and you can't reduce flooding by just doing one thing in one area of a catchment. So it's, it's the cumulative benefit of lots of things. It's not a project really. Our money comes in project form, but it's not a project. It's never finished. It's like farming. It's just a form of land and water course management forever in a cycle. So the idea that you do natural flood management in three years and then you pop off and do another project is, uh, is sadly mistaken. And people are discovering that this stuff doesn't really stop. You don't stop farming. It's a cycle, an endless cycle of, of, of change and, um, and management and stewardship. And it's best to think of natural flood management in the same way. It just carries on. And um, one of the myths is that it's leaving everything to go natural. It's absolutely the reverse. It's highly interventionist, as I'll hope you'll, you'll see. Um, it requires a lot of effort and a lot of work to to affect the proportion of flows in a catchment required to reduce flooding. So how do these changes that we can make to land management and land use influence runoff from flooding? We call it natural flood management, but I prefer in a, some ways because natural can take people off in that direction of thinking everything, we're just, we're just going to leave everything. It's really making enough changes to land use and management at a scale to affect the hydrology of the whole catchment. So in some ways you should think of it, if you're talking to some engineers, say it's just whole catchment hydrology. It's common sense. It's just rather than leave everything to the end and build a big wall, start to think about everything from the start of the system. It's a systems thinking approach to water and flooding. And it works basically by either increasing the amount of doormats in the landscape, so that's increasing roughness of flow pathways, increasing losses by infiltration or interception or evapotranspiration, and then creating this kind of temporary areas for attenuation. And note my bath is empty. There's an important, an, an important um, element to this is having those empty areas around the landscape. Ponds are fantastic. I've built lots of them. Uh, I've got my own pond. But water in, water out, if you think if that bath was full and you turn on the tap, the water just comes over the overspill. So ponds are great in the landscape, but they're not an element of storage that we can utilize without significant engineering on the outlets. So, Doormats, sieves, and empty baths. We've got to transfer that sort of thinking onto our landscape scale. And um, let's look at what we actually do. Now, I've got some 
slightly provocative images but and some slightly uh, provocative parceling up of what we might term different ways of managing land. Um, but of course these things run into each other. But there's a reason I've parceled these up into kind of types of things as we'll come on to. So the first sort of thing I want to talk about is, is basic land use change. So restoring habitats, nature recovery, because natural habitats in all their forms generally are rougher, which means water moves more slowly, they generally have better infiltration and evapotranspiration and slow things down. So they're basically slowing the whole system down of surface flows. And there's lots of examples. I've put up the kind of the wildest ones there, the continuum from rewilding right through to pocket parks and miniature forests. Um, there's lots of things you could do. Treat, you know, there's a, there's a whole range. That's our first kind of uh, sort of packet of, of works. The second stuff that I want to talk about is, is farming. So changes to farming practice and land management that will um, either affect soils and their ability to um, accept water or produce runoff, livestock management, um, and the way that we crop and till land to either decrease or treat compaction or maybe cause more compaction. So there's a whole range of activities around building better soil structure, adding organic uh, matter into soils. And I'm sure we'll hear much more about this later on. Um, the sad fact is most natural for management avoids this because we lack revenue paying powers, but also think about my role. I am in effect a, a fancy drainage officer with a district council. With a, with a slightly fancy title of natural for management officer. If I approach farmers uh, to talk about drainage, the conversation runs very well. But as soon as I start to talk about soil organic matter or infiltration rates or tillage, the conversation could quickly run dry because you know who am I to advise farmers on their tillage or their cropping regimes? And, and I lack the cash to influence those things. I've got lots of capital, but I haven't got a penny to pay someone next year in <laughs> revenue. So lots of natural for management avoids this. It's not because it's not important. Lots of people will say to me, what are you doing about soils? And I'll say, absolutely nothing, because I can't. I've got no mechanism to influence those things. So there's a huge gap in our, in our, in our kind of armory there. And the reason I'm compartmentalizing these things is largely about funding. Funding streams are ultimately what governs what we can do. <clears throat> Whether we call it natural for management or regenerative farming or organic farming or aquifer recharge, the funding uh, mechanisms that we can use govern the amount of activity we can influence and the time periods over which we can do that. This is what most people call natural for management, but it's only one element. And the reason lots of people do this is because it's easy. It's easy to fund this stuff and it's easy sometimes to get agreements to do it because it's off the factory floor of the farm by and large. Um, it's in the water courses or the margins. It's a, about affecting surface flows or small flows through streams and ditches. Um, so it's largely accepted. Um, I know some of it might look controversial, but you know, in Stroud, this is now very common. Thousands of these things around the catchment. Um, and this is very easy to fund using a capital funding mechanism available to local authorities and local, um, lead local sort of authorities and the environment agency. <clears throat> so it's the easiest stuff, it's most acceptable. So this is what we end up doing a lot of. Um, we're working directly in water courses. It can be very effective. And then there's this bigger stuff, which is, which I guess is, um, I guess we could call it de-engineering in some way. So this is the restoration of the ability of floodplains 
to act as floodplains, the realignment of defences on the coast or within our, within our rivers, and creating these larger areas of storage. Um, these need long leading times. They, they are quite often need lots of expert planning, a feasibility work. Um, so they're capital heavy. They also mean, you know, they are land use change effectively. So you're, you're stopping one activity and doing another. These are very compatible with flood granting aid that comes down from the Treasury into regional flood and coastal committees and the Environment Agency. Um, but they're not very compatible with uh, a, a charity or a local body undertaking this sort of work because you can't get the funding to do it and probably haven't got the expertise to put it in place. I'm generalising, there might be lots of expertise in those organisations, but, but you get the idea that if we split this kind of world up into those four basic packages, you can start to follow the money. So, you know, package one is about the habitat work, uh, biodiversity. Package two is largely around stewardship and agro-environment and advice to farmers. Package three is the sort of stuff that I can specialise in. And then this is the sort of stuff we might look to the Environment Agency to, to lead on or to undertake. And, um, and if, we, if you think about it logically and follow the water um, rather than the money, you've got rainfall and your surface flows and then it gathers into streams and ditches and main rivers. And then you can think you can sort of summarise the activities you might want to undertake. So at the rainfall level, you're basically talking about increasing field capacity or improving infiltration. So, you know, you can split it into grasslands and arable soils. They start to look a little bit like agro-environment options. And there is, there is a, there's a reason for that because these are the ones that um, we put together when I was working in the EA for elms and local nature recovery. Now, where that's got to, I'm not sure. Maybe that'll form a discussion later on. But uh, whether these exist, I'm not sure even now. Um, but then you can think about surface flows, making rougher areas of vegetation, um, looking at attenuating those flows. So you can see. Um, but the key thing is, and the key change that I think uh, might be needed, which as I say we can discuss later, is attaching revenue to what we think of as capital items because that will be the game changer and make them much more uh, attractive and accessible and we can scale up the in inter interventions across a landscape if we can stop thinking of this as a capital one-off project and more as a longer term revenue funded way of land and water management. The reason we like, and lots of people like natural flood management, is you get all these other benefits as well. So these are all kind of coming along in the coattails, and depending upon what we do and how we do it, we can, we can have a huge influence on the amount of diffuse pollution and runoff and soil erosion. Um, we can use habitats, as we've described. We can make lots of new habitats or restore lots. We can start to add up the amount of carbon we're getting as we raise water tables in, water tables in, in riparian areas and make boggy areas. Um, we can trap silts. There's all sorts of side benefits. So the reason people like this stuff is because not only can you reduce flood risk, but you can get all this other stuff as well. So I just want to kind of cover some how you might go about this as well as what we've done and some of the principles. Um, there's a great technical reason why local authorities should be leading natural flood management, and that's because uh, lead local flood authorities and district councils have responsibility for flood risk in ordinary water courses and surface waters. And <clears throat> primarily, that is where we should be aiming these sorts of interventions on land and ordinary water courses. By the time the River Wye has reached Goodrich, a few leaky dams are going to be washed away you know there's not there's not a lot of this approach we can do on the main river and it's not even you know that's a bit of a daft example but by the time the river wires reached Llangurig in Wales it's too big it's the it's the side streams coming into this system that are the main targets for this work so it's starting upstream 
as far as possible and prime, you know, even uh, by choice above the spring lines, whether that's a factor here, I'm not sure, but you know, in Stroud, starting above the spring line before there's even any water. Um, it's really important to um, work with the owners of land in a co-design process to do this stuff because you can't, you know, we've got no big stick to walk onto land and start demanding natural flood management. This is all uh, a voluntary approach. We've got to work with lots of landowners because we're not building one or two big things. There's lots of small things. So we need to involve landowners in the design of works. It won't work otherwise and allow their experience and evidence to guide uh, what we might go for and how it will work and, and where we do things. So try, you know, we're trying to get measures that fit with farming practice. And the way that we work in Stroud um, is if a landowner or a farmer offers their land for us to work with, I've got a derogation from the local authority finance office that means I can offer the contract to do that work first off without competition to the farmer. Because otherwise, there's a, there's a, a reasonable argument you could make which say we won't end up doing the work if we go out to competition. So for small value, and I'm talking kind of, you know, between, uh, generally most of our projects are under 5,000 pounds, so sort of around about the five or 6,000 pound mark, I can offer that contract to the farmer themselves to do the work for us under contract to the council supervised by me or even their chosen contractor because obviously lots of people have got favourite contractors that they worked with for years. So I work with a lot of contractors uh, and farmers to help them build natural flood management. Some of the farmers in Stroud have built more natural flood management than 99% of the people uh, in local authorities or the environment agency uh, for, you know, in ways that they've decided, they know exactly how they've built it, they know what it's meant to be doing. So there's all sorts of, of benefits to that approach rather than bringing in you know, the framework contractors to parachute them in and then do something on that land uh, which um, won't be acceptable or won't be to spec or for some other reason there'll be a problem with it. So we work with a lot of farmers and contractors and, and one of the, th the things that our councillors really like about this project is building that economic, there's a kind of rural economic um, uh, benefit, huge benefit to building skills and capacity in our contractor base, our woodland contractors and our farming contractors in doing some of this work. If we think that this is where a lot of land management might go in the next 10 years, where are the people who are equipped to do it? Um, are our colleges, our agricultural colleges training people in natural flood management? I don't think so. So it's, at the minute, it's down to people like me working with the, the contractor base to work with them to, to help them kind of develop those skills. So it's a big part of what, of what we do. And we've worked with dozens of, of local contractors and lots of our flood management has been built by the landowner. I also want to talk about, you know, the people having their natural flood management done to them. The people who, are the, who live in communities uh, that are at flood risk, residents who've been flooded. And we've got five flood action groups in Stroud. And um, in the formative years of this work, they were very heavily involved. Um, but, you know, there's a whole range of people. Flooding is intensely political, isn't it? And that's why, you know, MPs and politicians don their wellies whenever there's a flood. And it's it attracts a lot of political attention, inevitably, because it's a huge impact on people's lives. So lots of people are interested, local authorities, local councillors, uh, lots of NGOs. So there's a huge kind of network of people that are interested in this stuff. And you can't do any of it without those strong and sustained partnerships. So I work very closely with our flood action groups and I'll meet them fairly frequently. 
um, now in the pub because everybody knows each other and gets on. Um, and you know, that's taken, it's taken a long time to establish that trust. But they were involved in the initial project development. So they helped make this project work. Um, one of the chairs of the Look of Flood Group sat on the interview panel that employed me in 2014 um, and had a deciding say, along with the other people on that panel, as to who they would want to employ. It, all this stuff is standard stuff. You know, the you know, communities um, don't meet in the daytime, generally, like this, because everybody's at work. So community meeting, meeting, meeting residents and going to residence meetings is an evening occupation or a weekend occupation. And I generally try and get to all parish councils before we do stuff. It, uh, the, the, the level of um, intensity of that work has now reduced, but that's because we're eight years into the project and we've built that trust. That means people don't need to be emailed every time we get a chainsaw out or every time they see a digger. Um, we, can, we can crack on with our works. So uh, it's a bit cheesy. My wife says this is the cheesiest slide I've ever shown. Uh, but this is the effective, the most effective structure that we've built. So, you know, you can't do this stuff without building these relationships for all those reasons I've been through. You know, you're looking to deal effectively with dozens or hundreds of farmers and landowners, residence groups, communities, and they're all, you know, everybody's different and it all takes time to build those relationships and um, very easy to break. Uh, very difficult sometimes to build. So, you know, this is what gets me onto lots of land. This is what gets us uh, around the catchment. This is what gets us uh, doing stuff um, and being able to put those interventions in place that are going to reduce flood risk. So um, coming to the end, some of our lessons, compromise. Um, I, I will put my hand up and say I've built hundreds of suboptimal interventions in suboptimal locations. And with, with so much redundancy, it would, make, <laughs> it would make an engineer's eyes water. You know, we, you can't really engineer and model this stuff because you're making so many on-site decisions around trees. You know, a six-ton beech tree can't be micro-finessed two inches to the left once it's in the stream. So, compromise and accept that suboptimal approach. And it's taken me a while to, to kind of become comfortable with it. But, you know, there's something you've just got to accept. You can't always do what you want. So we design and build measures that require little or no maintenance. A lot of people are, and it's a discussion we might get into, obsessed about maintenance and, and liabilities and who's going to maintain it all. We don't maintain I'd say, I'd say we might have, might have scraped the odd bund, but generally speaking, 99% of the stuff we put in the landscape stays there, and then it either gradually just becomes absorbed, and if we need to do more, we'll just do more. We don't go around scraping silt out of leaky dams. We don't go around removing leaves from things. Um, we generally just let it get on and make the changes in the landscape it was designed to do. And if we, do, if we need to do more, we'll do some more. We don't mess around maintaining. Um, we always try and keep it local and building capacity in local volunteers. Didn't talk about them much, but we've used a lot of volunteers on, on suitable jobs and local contractors. Small and many is our watchword. It's, it's sometimes difficult. You do want to go big in some places, but the risk of doing something that then went wrong and then that undermining our whole project is far greater to me than the risk of not doing something, of, of missing 10 centimetres off the height of a bund. Um, so to me, I still take a slightly risk averse approach in the size of the interventions we put in place in the landscape because I'd rather do too little but get on there another day than than overdo it and completely undermine the whole kind of reputation of the project and the relationships we've got with the farmers and the um, So I focus on those kind of low risk certain wins and then live to work another day if we need to do more in a couple of years' time. 
So that's what we've done. I mean, interventions is a bit of a loose word. Some of those are massive and some of them are very small and some of them just describe work we've done in a whole kind of coup. Um, but we've calculated probably about 25% of that catchment area is now draining through stuff changes we've put in place with the, la with the landowners and the farmers in the Stroud Front. Um, we're about to start collecting a lot of very solid empirical evidence. We've been given a lot of um, kit by all colleagues in the Environment Agency in the National Groundwater Team to look at um, groundwater recharge and infiltration. But um, for some reason, academic institutions and other people are not that willing to give hundreds of thousands of pounds worth of free monitoring kit to local authorities and the district drainage officers. <laughs> I don't know, I don't know why. But anyway, so it's very hard to collect and people always say, where's your evidence? I've been so busy commissioning, designing, building, scrapping around in mud and doing things, monitoring uh, to the level needed to get peer-reviewed science published is a specialist job. And I know my limits. It's not me. And until someone's coming with cash and the ability to do that, then our monitoring has been anecdotal or based upon the gauges we've got through the, the whole catchment. We're just about to get some cash and some effort going. But using our flip gauges in the Sadbrook, which is a rapid response catchment, um, and looking at two very comparable events, um, they're not that recent now actually, we've seen a consistent reduction in the peak flows entering Stroud before it runs under the bus station and the cinema at one of the pinch points um, of about a metre. That's because we've now got dozens of things in that catchment, it's quite small, um, I reckon we're influencing about 85% of the total discharge coming through that little catchment. Um, we've had, you know, that's a Thousands, thousands of people from different groups uh, come and visit. We had 32 members of a Hungarian work visit in July that was very interesting and fantastic. Lots of uh, government ministry people from Hungary, academics, um, farmers, forest, big forestry crowd. Um, so we've got, we've got a lot of people coming to have a look around. Um, 25 is an underestimate. That's just the ones... We've gone back uh, and worked with farmers and landowners again. But sometimes we're on our third passes through this thing, um, you know, which which goes to um, uh, you know what I was saying about not trying to achieve everything at once. Don't assume that the first time you go on some land or talk to a landowner, you've got to do everything. I've got to get everything I want off my chest. You know, take your time. It can. You can, you, can, you can live to work another day and building that trust is more important than trying to do everything you want immediately. And we've developed that strong partnership locally, um, locally and regionally. And we're getting, importantly for the funders and our local politicians, we get positive feedback and engagement from the community. And the people who have uh, suffered from flooding in the Stroud Valleys, um, we haven't prevented flooding, but I think the, the empowerment they've got from being involved and the, the well-being from feeling like <coughs> something is happening, whereas before nothing was happening, is immense. And, and we get that, we're getting that feedback from the community. Um, so, yeah, we haven't solved flooding by any means. And I don't think we ever will, but at least the people who are being flooded feel like something's being done. And I think that's, that's um, it's very important to people's um, well-being to think that they're not being ignored. So I think I'll leave it there. This is a, a Stroud based poet who's at school with my wife in Stroud. And uh, he was poet in residence for the Pasture Fed Livestock Association a few years ago, Adam Horowitz. And, um, and he's got, you know, he, he spent uh, weeks on four farms uh, producing poetry for them. But some of the stuff that he came across is incredibly relevant to us. And 
the great thing about natural philosophy for me, and why I've stuck with it, I guess, is it's a fantastic story. It's you know, there's there's a there's a there's a great kind of confluence of an ability to adapt to the climate change that you know increased intensity of uh, flooding and rainfall. Um, we've got we know that our farming systems need to adapt. The communities want to be more involved. There's 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 any number of different kind of positive stories you can get from it. And uh, this last kind of stanza at this point: too much fact runs off busy people like water from compacted soil. Learn how to open them to the seeds of ideas, water them with stories, and watch them grow. These are one of my favourite lines. So there we are. I'll leave you with that.